Welcome, everyone. I'm Charlie Melcher, the founder of the Future of Storytelling Summit. And we're delighted to have here today for our weekly virtual roundtable conversation, Ian Schaefer. Uh, Ian was one of our speakers at the Fall Summit this last October. And we're delighted to have him joining us today for a conversation. Welcome, Ian. Hey, great to be here. Thanks, Charles. So for those of you who don't know Ian, he's one of advertising's most influential voices in the arena of interactive marketing and social media. Uh, formerly Vice President of New Media at Miramax Films, he left there in about 2002 and started his company Deep Focus. Deep Focus is an Emmy award-winning integrated digital agency with an expertise in social media, a real deep focus in social media. His clients include such distinguished companies as Pepsi, Microsoft, Nestle, Purina, um, and some amazing work for the Museum of Modern Art and AMC's Mad Men. So we're really honored to have you with us today, Ian. Welcome. Hey, thanks. Thank you. Um, so we also have a number of other Im influential, important people joining the conversation today. And I'm going to ask each of you, oh, before I do that, let me just say, anyone who's watching us, because I always forget to say this, if you'd like to ask a question during today's conversation, um, please go ahead and, and tweet that to us at our handle, which is at FOSTORG. Um, okay, so now let's ask everyone to introduce themselves. Annette, would you say hi? Oops, Annette, I think your mute button might be on. I'm Annette Simmons, and um, I, I'm the past of storytelling and hopefully joining the future. I wrote The Story Factor, and whoever tells the best story wins. And I've been teaching storytelling uh, for leadership ever since 1998, and finally beginning to embrace digital storytelling and social media. I hope to learn a lot. Glad to have you with us. Thank you. Hey, Daria. Hi, um, I'm Daria. I'm a proud of FOSS speaker from 2012 and performer. And um, I'm a singer songwriter, musician, and as people, all my geniuses here on Google Plus know, um, one of the first people to do concerts through Hangouts and it changed my whole life meeting all of you guys and playing concerts for you around the world um, like this, both virtually and now lately in person. And um, so it's a blast to be here. I'm always so excited to talk about the future of storytelling and entertainment and music and social and where all of this stuff is going. I think we're all kind of pioneering and bushwhacking together, so it's always good to mind meld. <laughs> <laughs> we're very excited to have your mind here melding. <laughs> so welcome, Daria. Um, hey, Rohit, how are you doing? Good, and uh, hey, I'm, uh, I'm Rohit Bhargava, and uh, I am... Uh, the founder of the Influential Marketing Group and also author of Lykonomics. And uh, I am very, very interested in using storytelling for marketing. Um, and that's sort of my uh, big area that I talk to clients about. And I also teach a class at uh, Georgetown here in uh, Washington, D.C., where I live, uh, which focuses on lots of different marketing, new marketing techniques, and storytelling is one of them. So I'm excited to join the conversation today, too. Thank you for being here. Okay, so let me start us off, Ian. I, I'm, I know you have a background in traditional storytelling, right? A world, you came from uh, the Weinstein Company or Miramax the mm -hmm. Films, and um, I'm really interested in, in how you think that social media storytelling is different than traditional media storytelling. Yeah, th th well, there, there are a lot of differences. One is that it's completely fractured, right? So um, historically, storytelling has been a very linear experience, right? And so there was, um, you know, you had things set up in uh, typical acts with uh, denouement, right? And like, you know, th there were lots of traditional methods that have been in place for centuries, um, you know, to tell stories that we were actually comfortable with hearing. And they may have had different effects. They may have made us feel uncomfortable. But um, the fact of the matter is it's been historically a very linear experience. What, um, what has happened, thanks to the, the nature of the Internet as being literally a web, um, everything is tangled up within one another. And um, there are lots of different ways for stories to fragment and for people to adopt a story and take it as their own. Um, so whereas in the past, people told stories, and as it passed from person to person and ear to ear, um, 
those stories um, took on their own kinds of characteristics, um, and every person that told the story kind of made it their own. What's happening now is that like, people are picking up stories midstream and then making it their own and completely co-opting them. Um, and add to that, the stories are being told across different media. So um, whereas before you would you know kind of absorb a story on a very horizontal, um, you know, a horizontally oriented format, and you would lean back and receive the story. Now people are taking the story, remixing it in real time, um, you know, completely making it their own, so much so that it doesn't even look like the original story that was being told. Um, and this is all happening, you know, in real time. And yes, we're all sharing, you know, viral videos from Psy, um, but we're also, you know, creating parodies of them within minutes. Um, you know, and all of that, you know, has really changed. And, and I guess maybe the one of the biggest um, differences that are out there is that um, the storytellers, or I guess the the people that were selling the stories, um, used to be in charge of distribution. Um, now, distribution is just as much happening, um, you know, between audience members, and that's a completely democratizing way, um, you know, to determine you know which stories um, you know are bubbling up to the top versus you know, for example, which movie theaters would choose to um, screen a particular film. So that's a uh, a lot, lot has changed, and, and so much of this change has actually happened within the last several years um, that it's actually really difficult to not only come to grips with it, but build business models around it. So I love this idea that you're saying that, that people become the distribution mechanism, mm -hmm. right? So it's no longer just this sort of centralized or the powers that be. It's now decentralized to the consumer. So um, how do you get then people to distribute your stories? Like what's the secret of... of of stories that get spread. Um, this is going to sound very um, Michael Eisner-ish, but uh, <laughs> I mean, great content tends to win. I'm not, you know, it's not doesn't absolutely win. Um, it does win because it's great, but it's way more likely to win if it is if it is really good. Um, and um, but I will say that the definition of what's good changes um, and ebbs and flows depending upon the format, right? And so something that's um, that's great in, say, a Facebook news feed, which is amazingly, you know, a place where people discover a ton of their, their content. Um, something that works within the news feed is going to be different than something that works on television. And what's good in the news feed isn't necessarily good on television. What's good on your mobile phone isn't necessarily what's good in a movie theater. So um, the definition of good um, has to exist within the context of the medium, um, you know, that it's displayed within. And, you know, I think that's, it always comes down to good content. It's just again uh, understanding which variables make up, um, you know, the term good, um, you know, within each uh, device, really. Yeah, I think that you know one of the interesting things that um, that I've found around this idea of having good content is the more personal content is, the more good it seems, even if it's not actually good. Like from a you know entertainment point of view, <laughs> you know what I mean. Like if it's deeply personal and it's something that I really care about, you know, it's it's one of those amazing insights. Like I remember reading about the moment when Dale Carnegie first created his uh, course on how to win friends and influence people, and one of the big insights that he realized was in order to get people comfortable with personal uh, with public speaking, which is one of the aspects of that course, he had to get them talking about themselves. And as soon as they started talking about themselves, they became comfortable with the idea of public speaking because they were talking about something they knew about. And I think we do have that uh, an element of that in storytelling, which is the more deeply personal something is that I share, the better the story is because it's personal, not necessarily because it's you know shot with high quality video or any of the traditional yeah. metrics we used to use for great quality content. Yeah, I would definitely agree. Um, and even I think he can even take it a step farther now with the kind of tools like what we're using right now. You know, so before just an incredibly intimate, personal, like a song or some or, or a way of sharing something that's really, really coming from your heart. Yeah, that really sticks out and comes across for people. And then what I've experienced through my, my own personal, you know, uh, experience here on Google Plus and and going around doing doing these crazy concerts that I do, is that. Um, when it then goes from just be, being personal and then becomes inclusive from that place too, and and everyone involved kind of becomes a part of the story, that that in my experience has been the thing that really 
really sends stuff out and really spreads it and really shares it and, and it's also coming from this incredibly authentic fun place because people are sharing it because they feel apart and um, so that's I, I think not only a really cool kind of marketing technique but it's also kind of healing and wonderfully human to feel like you're a part of something like when I do concerts and hangouts like this it's when the people come into the windows they're like on stage with me and actually I've been doing that in person like I did at FOSS, putting a giant screen on stage and they're literally on stage with me uh, no matter where they are in the world and so that's something that I've had a lot of fun exploring like how, how I'm actually looking now with the album that I'm about to make how can I bring them totally into the process and make it completely interactive and um, so I think that's another fun place for people to explore now in the, in the future of storytelling is all the ways that we can take all that personal stuff and then really connect personally with other people and get that all mixed up in it is a uh, I think it's definitely a recipe for, for a lot of sharing and a lot of attention and also it comes from a really nice place too. It, it seems to me like this is almost what you guys are saying about social media storytelling being this kind of personal experience or participatory experience in a way kind of takes us back to the origins of storytelling. Um, yes. And then what do you, were you shaking your head, do you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. I, um, listening to you talk about the linearity uh, non-linearity, and then the old-fashioned was linear. Actually, when I teach storytelling, I have to teach people to to inhibit that feeling that a story needs to be linear and look at the non-linearity. It's almost like it's always been fractured in terms of you're going to take a piece from here and a piece from there. And uh, only when I can get people to let go of that need to be uh, rational is when they can come up with their personal story and that's when I began it's always who are you and why are you here is your personal story because I think if you can't tell a story about who you are and why you're here how can you possibly tell a story that becomes personal to anybody else which is the goal and content always wins and always has won the only reason we had word of mouth back in the day which is all this is is a digitized word of mouth was because the story was personal and uh, became interesting only because you now are in my world and I'm connecting with you. So Ian, so tell us a little bit about um, some of the secrets that you've developed uh, for stories that are social that are really going to spread. I mean you've talked about it being personal but I know you've, uh, we've had conversations and you've mentioned things about visual and, and short and you know, just some of the like practical things that, that one should think about if they wanted to build a successful social media campaign. Yeah, I mean, well, one of the things that, that we've learned is that um, time, and it's, it's usually time is usually not on your side, um, but, um, you know, in the case of, you know, how social media has evolved, I mean, we know uh, time is actually a variable in the relevance of a message to somebody, right? And so, um, you know, things that are displaying in your Twitter timeline, um, for example, are incredibly urgent, true or not, right? Um, you know, in your Facebook newsfeed, they might be relevant to you um, because of your interests, for sure, but time is, is certainly a factor, and, and that newsfeed is actually starting to reflect um, more... Um, of kind of a real-time, uh, you know, uh, information consumption than it ever has. So the notion of time being, um, you know, an important part of relevance um, has actually, that, that, that what is defined as time has actually become really short. So um, we have found a lot of success and actually, um, you know, as an agency, our job is to kind of craft brand stories, but we're usually not starting from scratch, right? We're usually, um, you know, coming up with some variant um, of what that of the story that the brand has historically tried to tell, um, you know, and seeing it through uh, a lens of urgency. Um, that lens of urgency, you know, might uh, include, um, you know, something that the Supreme Court, for example, might be um, deliberating, right? And you know, how does something that's happening in real life um, that people are actually interested in, um, you know, how is that seen through the eyes of the brand story? Not necessarily the brand itself, but through the story that that brand has historically told. So, for example. You know, with Absolute, um, that's a brand that's that's historically really openly supported um, marriage equality. And so, when the Supreme Court is deliberating on marriage equality, um, how can Absolute see that story through its own um, through its own history? And you know, so we you know are now the keepers of that Absolute campaign that we used to tear out of magazines, but are now you know threading that storyline literally every day based upon that day's events. 
So, um, you know, being able to see and make, you know, cultural um, critique um, in many ways, you know, around things that are actually happening and, yes, things that people are genuinely interested in because for the most part, people are not interested in brands. It's just not a normal thing that they talk about. So how do we, you know, allow the brand or enable the brand to talk about something that is of great interest to the consumer? And, you know, and then how do we uh, illustrate that or how do we, um, you know, make somebody um, encounter that in the right way that they will in fact want to share it. Because one of the things that we've learned from you know, creating this kind of content and, and telling stories in this way is that the outcome is different than it used to be, right? So the outcome for telling a story is actually comprehending what it is that the story is trying to say. Now, we take that part for granted and it needs to be instant comprehension because the outcome that we're looking for is actually a share. Like we want somebody to share that story with somebody else. Because for us, I mean, our role in this whole, you know, in the, in the brand storytelling architecture is actually to enable the audience to tell the story on our behalf or to share along a story that we are, you know, telling over a long period of time. So, you know, obviously short to the point, pithy, something that works in, um, you know, the, the context of a news feed, something that's timely, that's urgent, something that's highly visual in nature, something that's short. So even videos can be shared, right? But um, you know, typically when you see a video come up in your social media feeds, there's a big giant play button and a thumbnail, and that basically uh, says this may not be worth your time to watch. <laughs> and so um, you know, which is why we love uh, you know the, the the Vine format. Yeah, it's six seconds, but you know what? It actually, as you're scrolling up through it, it plays automatically. Oh, and it loops, which is oddly memorizing. Mesmerizing, rather. <laughs> Maybe memorizing too. Um, you know, so that's um, you know that kind of repetition um, works. That instant playback works. Um, you know, and the fact that you can kind of skip right past it also works too. So it's so all these kinds of formats. And you know, if if you let it um, actually uh, cramp your creative style, which it can, because it's it's very easy to think about social as being something that is a lot of like memes and cute cat photos and things like that. Um, but it is a tremendous creative canvas because of the fact that we were talking about earlier, which is that it's completely not linear. Um, and, you know, time in this case um, can be your friend um, if you are able to act quickly, tell stories quickly, and fork them quickly as well. Yeah. And I, when you were talking, I was thinking, you know, it, it, it occurred to me social is exactly that. It's social. And I think as we continue to connect in new ways like this and tell our own stories and, and kind of co-author stories together online, it becomes this total humanization of, of the internet and like, you know, and, it, and so it isn't just cat photos and stuff like that, it's stuff like this where everybody's connecting and, um, and those stories really are getting out. So yeah, I think, I mean, anyone who's watching who's either coming from the, the older storytelling side or the newer, you know, there's there's a great confluence of stuff of pulling it all together. And actually, Ned, I wanted to tell you, um, it, it occurred to me, my mom was friends with Diane Wolkstein. And, and so I know about this sort of like super traditional storytelling world a little bit. And I was thinking while we were talking, wait, I remember when I was little and Diane telling stories and doing the quick crack and asking for a response from the audience. I was like, man, that's exactly the same kind of thing we're doing. We're asking for a share. We're asking for like, we're asking for a hit back. Or I do comment like these giant conversations with comments in my stream here on Google Plus, and we get this huge conversation going. And that's really cool that that, that call and response exists even in that older version of the storytelling world. Oh, you're muted again. <laughs> Obvi I'm obviously old school. <laughs> it's, yeah, the participation. And one of the things, yeah. you know, my first job was in direct marketing. And so I see what we're doing as, as a, a high, basically a sped up form with new technology of direct marketing. And without knowing whether we're actually making connections and those connections are selling, I'm confused. So what sort of measures are in place to understand, I mean, other than success? Because in the old days, TV was something that nobody knew whether it worked or not. So we got to spend as much money as we wanted, you know? And um, so I'm... And that I'm, hasn't changed. <laughs> Yeah, th th those were the days yesterday. Yeah, right. <laughs> were great. So I'm interested in, in what sort of, you know, I'm sure that companies are asking for this, this connection to sales or something in terms of measures. And I'm going to take the opportunity to ask what it is. 
Yeah, I think uh, I mean you know if I if I were to look at it, I would say that um, what storytelling has managed to do is give a way for brands to spend money on the one thing that they know actually works in marketing, which is word of mouth. And if you ask any of these brands, you know, what's the number one source of uh, them getting other consumers to uh, come to their products, to consider their services? It's, you know, somebody recommending it. Now, Absolutely. it used to be, you know, in person, right? But now we've got Google, uh, we've got, you know, everything online, we've got Amazon reviews, we've got lots and lots of ways. But, you know, what people share is, has always been based on their experience. But now with the story, you have the ability to add a little bit of context to that. You know, so if you look at a brand like Dyson, for example, you know, the context that anybody who uses a Dyson vacuum cleaner has of that brand is the experience they have of vacuuming their own carpet, but also the experience of the guy standing up there and saying, hey, I'm all about invention. I invented this product, and here's why I thought it would be good. So now the stories that you get, if you look at reviews of Dyson, they bring the story of the company together with their own experience, and it's so much more powerful as an element of word of mouth. And I think that that's what companies are really trying to get to, which is looking at that outbound word of mouth and saying, is that happening? And is so, it happening with our message in it? Yeah, so I mean, at the risk of like sounding creepy, not a, <laughs> not, not a creeper, which is very different, <laughs> but uh, at the risk of sounding creepy. So, you know, there, there are, are, are methods out there where if you are telling, you know, a particular story at a, certain level of scale, we can direct, um, we can measure directly back to sales. Right. So, um, you know, so for example, so uh, Facebook is partnered with a company called Data Logics, right? And Data Logic is, um, because of that partnership, um, we're able to determine of the people that were exposed um, to a particular message and ideally, you know, content um, story, you know, in their newsfeed, um, how many of them actually purchased the product um, within a set period of time. And you can do name to name, whereas yeah. name yes. to name? Yeah, so we know uh, they, they won't provide, they won't provide <laughs> us with that information, but literally they, I, I question who they is sometimes, but, but they know <laughs> that, um, you know, that, uh, that uh, you know, a person that saw, you know, a particular piece of content in the newsfeed, whether or not they bought some, a, a particular product. Um, and they do this with matching, and they do, obviously, they're using, like, Axiom and credit card data, or whatever they use to, to match this up. Um, it's no different than when you're walking by, like sometimes when you're, um, you know, like you buy a pregnancy test at Walmart and then you get a baby catalog in two weeks, right? Like those are the, you know, th those kinds of things have been happening for a long time. Um, <laughs> you know, when, when they're in social, they get, you know, they, they tend to be creepy because, it, you know, it, it actually people think that you're listening um, and you're or watching them. Um, you know, that's always been true. But we're able to tell, and we've proven that you know consistent exposure um, via someone you know right so word of mouth essentially um, yeah. people distributing content um, to other people um, can actually impact sales like literally register receipts um, that's, that's amazing a what, time, which is amazing what's the name of the company again uh, it's, the company is called data logics l o g i x Big There's brother. another, um, you know, it's interesting because the, um, so that, you're, Ian's totally right, that's been around um, for some time and it's getting smarter and smarter, the analytics side of it. Mm -hmm. What's also interesting though is I just came across this company in um, Amsterdam that's essentially building not only a list of, you know, it's one thing to say, okay, this is what you're going to prefer because this is the stage of life you're in. Um, or these are the products that you've gotten, therefore you might also be interested in something else, which is kind of the Amazon model, right? Like the you may also like. Um, but now you've got these companies that are trying to figure out how you as a person make your decisions. And so this company in Amsterdam is essentially persuasion profiling. Um, that's what their system does. So it says you as an individual are more influenced by authority type of messages. Hmm. And therefore, the messages that you will respond to in advertising are these types of messages, and therefore, that's what you should be served, not only because you're interested in buying the lawnmower, but because the message that you'll respond to when it comes to buying the lawnmower is an authority message versus an influence message versus a you know, community-oriented message. Oh, that's so, so that's like that next level. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
So it's not just are you going to like it or not. It's you know what type of person are you, and therefore what type of message do you get. It's fascinating stuff. <laughs> But creepy, yes. Yeah, that's so, super creepy. It's, creepy. <laughs> it's you know, funny too. I think also I'll just throw out there for everyone who's numbers challenged like me. I, I mean, numbers can be really great, especially when they're going in your direction, which is awesome. Um, and I, I've finally had a little bit of experience with that, which is super fun. But I'm so not a numbers person. And so for me, I kind of, again, and that kind of connect with an older tradition maybe of what I'm feeling from the people that I can actually see and what I'm feeling from the comments and the, you know, the responses and the retweets and all of that stuff. Like I'm more of an emotional, I'm an artist, more of an emotional being, so I'm sort of taking a barometer all the time of, of that emotional feedback. And, um, and that's really what kind of, you know, the, the wave that I like to ride and that really inspires me. And I would definitely encourage people, especially, you know, if you're in my kind of situation, if you're an artistic person, if you're a, a young, whatever, entrepreneur or anyone who's sort of starting up rather than these guys who are already the titans of their industries in this hangout, I would, I would say that, you know, to, to not get scared at the beginning about numbers and stuff because it, you can get to this place where you feel like, oh, God, I'm starting at zero. And it can scare you to even take the first step, you know? And I was definitely in that place just maybe like a year ago with total big fat zero, you know? And um, by focusing on the emotional feedback and that sort of more traditional response of how is this feeling between you and me, that was enough of a, a hit and enough of a support for me to ride. And then the numbers started to kind of jump to catch up, you know? And so I wouldn't get scared. Anybody, any newbies out there like me watching, you know, don't let the numbers stress you out in the beginning. They'll, they'll catch up to the emotional feedback, I think. So I, I think that's a great, great comment and really valuable for us <laughs> all to you. hear. And I actually want to share, kind of conflate it with what Rohit was just saying, which is yeah. there's even a new technology, newer technology that's coming where um, using facial recognition and voice intonation analysis um, that they're building um, algorithms that can tell basically what somebody's emotional response is to the thing that they're consuming and watching. So in real time. <laughs> Can't we just look at each other's faces? <laughs> <laughs> so imagine you know, watching a music video or, a, or an ad and having the camera on your computer be able to see that you are responding very happily to this ad or you're disgusted by this or oh and then God. to have it actually the next step is that they'll be able to actually alter the nature of the story that they're telling you in response to your real-time subtle subconscious facial uh, you know, responses emotional responses um, and that's that's the like the next level of <laughs> <laughs> emotional response of storytelling. You know, I, I, you know, it's it's funny. I, I think that that's that's like another. I think we have to be careful to look at something like that um, as not being what the future of storytelling is going to look like, but rather you know what the future tool set to tell stories is going to look like, right? Because okay. you don't want to suck the performance aspect out of storytelling. Um, you know, because uh, you want people to be able to respond to something um, as a whole, not second by second. You know, I, I remember um, working on um, Mad Men early on and, uh, you know, looking at different ways to actually experience Mad Men um, simultaneously on the screen um, as you do with the device in your hand, because that's generally the way that people consume media these days anyway. Um, and I was actually struck in a good way, actually, um, by something that Matthew Weiner said, which was that, um, look, Mad Men is, is created to be watched in a dark room with no other screens glowing but the one that your, your senses are focused on for that, um, you know, for that hour. And that's, a, um, that's what it's made for. If it was made for some other you know, kind of thing, it would be something completely different. Um, and I think you have to appreciate the story for the context that the storyteller themselves um, you know, has set for it. If, if everything was yeah. personalized... Like if everyone had a different experience, you know, with a particular piece of content, we'd lose the thing that gets us to talk about that content. Like we talk about Mad Men because we're all watching the same thing. Yeah. If we're all watching different things, it would be like such an intensely personal experience that the, the social aspect might not even happen. So, yeah, um, totally. Those shared experiences, like, you know, all the people that were watching Apollo 13, you know, like that's, 
people share that, right? The reason yeah. why sports is such a, like a, a big social thing is that everyone's watching the exact same thing. If we were all like reading our own Choose Your Own Adventure novel, we talk about it maybe for three minutes, that the fact that we were all having that experience and then that would be it. Yeah, true that. Common, I, you know? I was, yeah, while you were talking, I was thinking, you know, just again from an artist's point of view, yeah, I think you have to, you can get excited with co-creating with with your audience and all of that stuff, and there's some really fun stuff to play with there. But I then I think as an artist, you have to make a decision about what is your artistic statement and who are you as an artist and what are you putting out there. Not you know, I kind of have to stick to your guns and and to your own artistic vision at some point, you know, or else yeah, it just gets lost in the wind, right? So a good example, I was trying to play with that in my own world. And so um, I had this thing, actually, that I talked about at Future Storytelling called The Ripple Effect, which was in, a, 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 I wanted to co-create a song, but I didn't want to go, okay, you guys pick the notes, then who's writing the song, you know? So um, I saw these word clouds online that, like, take everything that you're talking about. So I used those, like, magnetic word poetry. I got the word clouds from the fans, from the geniuses, and I connected the words in a way that I saw them and made lyrics out of it. So I was using their content. It was personal to them. I said, like, you, you are the this line, you were this line, but I was still artistically interpreting it. So anyway, that was my own personal take on like, how do you do this without losing you, you know? And I think I think that's important. And if everything's customized to you, then yeah, there's no common ground anymore. Well, and I do, do think also there is this difference between storytelling for marketing and to sell something versus storytelling for entertainment. Yeah. And, you know, there is this idea of the lean back experience, as, you know, somebody from HBO uh, called it on stage at an event that I remember seeing. And it was kind of this moment where, you, you know, you don't want the other screens. It's like the Mad Men. You want to be in the dark room. You want to actually enjoy that experience versus the marketing thing, which is uh, we want to tell a story that people remember that's super optimized to reach them at the moment when they're ready to hear it in a way that they'll actually remember so that they can either tell somebody else about it or actually act on it and buy something. And I do think that they're, you know, the, the purpose behind some of these things means that, you know, yeah, we do have to be careful, and I think it's, it's a good caution, this idea that we don't want to forget um, that storytelling, you know, the, the power of storytelling in a non-tech optimized way is you have those moments of disgust along the way, to uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. to something really great, um, and that's the story arc that we don't want to lose because we're hyper optimizing so that every five seconds is you know a smile on somebody's face. Yeah, yeah. So, so let me just ask though: Isn't there some argument to be made that if you look back through the tradition of um, storytelling, uh, and particularly in, in written form, right, the history of, of books and reading, that to some degree you've always been um, co-creating? that the author is writing a text, but the images and the, the context and the sort of pictures that you place with what you read, the way you imagine that story is <clears throat> entirely created by the reader. And we each have a completely different vision of what we're reading. Um, I think, I yeah. think that's a beautiful sentiment, yeah. I think co-creation has always been part of storytelling and one of the things that really bugs me is when uh, somebody wants to tell a story and they want to practice it and that's it. You know, it's going to change every time you tell it and so when when I'm teaching storytelling one of the things is understanding that your story is going to be completely different every time. These linear tools, like even trying to make up a recipe for finding a story I see a lot of recipes like a story has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and there's an arc. And that's that may be true. It's like writing a PhD on Faulkner. You absolutely understand Faulkner, but it doesn't make you Faulkner. <laughs> you know? And so uh, I think the idea of understanding these linear tools that help us measure can also destroy that which we seek to create. Hmm. And uh, the, the whole facial recognition something is like yeah you're gonna have disgust but you can't have joy of someone being saved from a horrible situation without the horrible situation mm. and so a lot of the linear tools I think they need to be judged in terms of whether they actually uh, contribute in a way that keeps the creativity because I'm an artist at heart I've decided to live the artist life a long time ago and tools <laughs> you know, they, 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 you know, they tie us up, man. They, they give us boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, one of the, one of the things that I, um, I remember uh, 
thinking about and actually experiencing myself was, you know, if you imagine that moment when music, right, has been uh, around for a long time, and exactly what you said, Charlie, it's, uh, you know, you hear music and you kind of imagine what the story is. And, you know, unless you're in a musical or an opera or something where you're actually seeing it, you know, you always just experienced it. But then, you know, think about that moment when music videos came along. And all of a sudden it was like somebody gave you an interpretation of what this song was supposed to mean. And there were people that kind of felt like, you know what, like that's going to kill an element of music because now you've got someone telling you the official story behind a song that might have meant something completely different to different people. Um, And, you know, I think it did. I mean, to be honest, for me at least, like I remember sometimes I would have a song that I would hear and I would think about it in a certain way. And then, you know, maybe a year or two later I would see the video and I'd be like, oh, that's not what I was thinking about at all. Um, That's why, you know, I said earlier, like time is such an important context, like the frame of reference that you're in. Um, You know, like we romanticize you know, our favorite song because it's the song that we first made out to, right? Or like, <laughs> um, or a movie because of who we went to see it with. Like th- that context is everything. And there are two examples of that that are probably really worth um, noting. So one, and nobody, very few people actually have seen this because um, no one buys CDs anymore. But um, in the, um, <laughs> like everyone's like, what's a CD? I've never, <laughs> I've never pressed a CD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so um, but in the, um, in the liner notes, for, um, and I just discovered this uh, two days ago, but in the liner notes of the Django Unchained soundtrack is um, a nice little personal note from Quentin Tarantino, who uh, basically says that, um, you know, you'll notice that in a lot of the tracks that we chose, you know, for this album, you hear the, the, the pops and scrapes of, a, um, of an album, of an actual record, vinyl, mm. playing. Um, and he's like, yeah, we could have gone... Um, I won't say it as like uh, animated as he would. But like, yeah, we you know we could have gone and gotten the you know the the studio quality you know digitally compressed version of these songs. But I wanted you to hear these songs the way that I heard them that inspired me to make the scenes that I made. Um, so putting you in putting you the 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 viewer the listener um, you know into the creator's frame of reference for why you know he chose particular songs that sounded a particular way. <laughs> in his room, on his record player, I felt was just a completely, um, it didn't personalize it for the, for the viewer. It personalized it though, like, you know, it put the viewer in the, in the mind of the creator, um, which I thought is, uh, you know, probably the best storytellers in history were able to do um, repeatedly, um, you know, especially filmmakers. And um, that was awesome. There's also a great TED Talk, um, um, awkwardly delivered by David Byrne from The Talking Heads. You know, yeah, he talks about um, music in the context of architecture, like yeah. music, you know, being created for the environment within which it was meant to be listened with. Um, you know, which is, um, you know, you can apply that, you know, to the whole, um, you know, it's very McLuhan-ish, um, you know, in that the medium is the message. Um, the medium, in that, not that the medium itself is the message, but the medium defines, um, you know, what the message uh, eventually becomes. And your choice of medium um, you know, dictates, uh, you know, the way that people receive that story. And now as media has become more urgent, again, that time um, is kind of everything. So, um, you know, whether it's being able to call back to a particular point in time to you know, which a piece of content was created or the moment in time with which that content is being consumed, these are now, you know, some of the creative decisions that, that we have to make as, uh, as storytellers. It's interesting. I think the the music video thing. Just circle back for that for a second. I think I've had both experiences, or uh, as a fan, and and then as an artist too. But um, I think there is is just to devil's advocate. There's also the flip side of of I've had the experience of a song that maybe I didn't connect with that much, and then I saw the video, and it opened up this entire world that I wasn't expecting. You know, um, I think something like like as poppy and and sort of trivial sounding as like um, Rihanna's "We Found Love in a Hopeless Place." I don't. I don't know if you guys have seen that video, but it's just a dance theme. I was thinking, so the hangout doesn't get shut down. But <laughs> but then the video was like this incredibly raw, visceral, crazy, yeah. tragic, amazing, cinematic, like artistic thing. And I went, whoa, okay, that's I actually jam out to the song now because I, you know, and I didn't care about it so much before I saw the video. So there's that, and um, I think that yeah. Uh, oh, I was going to say something else <laughs> out of my head, but but yeah, I, th- I think that um. That um, that we can really get into the experience of of 
interpreting things in different ways. And, and then as an artist, oh, that's what I was going to say. Um, I think one place where storytelling comes in for me is I often find, um, and this is interesting. So I recently heard, I'm going to get back to it. I, I recently heard there's one single factor. There was a study. What is the one single factor that makes people like a song, like want to buy it, like really, really, really like it enough to want to buy it and listen to it and stuff like that? And the one single factor I was thinking, I don't know, is it the hook? Is it the core? You know, is it the way the beat drops? It was if they had ever heard it before, you know? And <laughs> And they heard it in a store, or it was a background, or in the commercial, or a sink, or whatever. And maybe you didn't even know that you heard it before, but something in you says, oh, yeah, I like this, because it's familiar somewhere in the inner workings of your brain. And um, so I actually have found that I sort of discovered it through Hangouts, but now I do it in my live concerts, too. I feel compelled to tell the story of the song sometimes before I even deliver it. And, or I'll even even sing a cappella some of the lines in the song and talk about what I was feeling when I was writing it. And then when I come back to it a few minutes later, inside of the song, everybody, even if they're hearing it for the first time, they're totally into it. They're, they're singing along or they're, yeah. they're feeling what I was feeling. So it's a nice little trick to maybe it's play a, with, you know? You feed yeah. a, a little, spoon feed a little bit and then you come back around and it's like, hey, we know this now, you know? Which is a big, Such a powerful it, thing. It, yeah, it explains yeah. why, you know, sampling culture is what it is. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, for me, it was uh, one of the most powerful things I remember learning back when uh, I was going to be a playwright and a screenwriter in my early days <laughs> before I found marketing <laughs> and, you know, a career. <laughs> um, yeah, way, way back, right? Um, you know, I, did an, I did an internship at a local theater here in D.C., and I actually told this story um, on stage just a couple months ago at, a, at an arts conference when I was um, doing a talk there. And uh, basically, I went and I saw the same show 30 different times. Um, and, you know, I, you never do that usually, but, you know, I was interning there and I was ushering and whatever. Um, and there was this one performance of that show that uh, the audience was just into on an extreme level. It was just, you know, off the hook. They were crazy. They were laughing at everything. They had a standing ovation. And the only thing different about that performance I was, and I was talking about it was it was the understudy performance. And the reason why everybody was so into it was because everybody in the audience had some sort of personal connection to the people on stage. They were their family. They were their friends. Because that was the one day when the understudies got to perform. And it was this real-life example of how powerful an effect it is if you know something about the performers and they're not just actors on stage. And no matter how good good they are and you know on a technical level of course the main actors were better than the understudy actors but that didn't matter what mattered was the personal connection that the audience had to the understudies and that was this really powerful lesson for me that you know if you don't that personal connection really does trump everything else and so Daria when you're talking about like giving people the back the backstory behind some of the songs I mean that's such a powerful thing because now I mean the songs themselves may be great but that gives it that extra effect Thanks. Yeah, and I even weave them into the, I get inspired on the fly and I'll, you know, they start ending up in the lyrics and stuff, so it's fun, but um, but thank you. Yeah, it's, it definitely changes the, the temperature of the room, whether the room is virtual or, or physical, when, when you, yeah. now, then it means something, you know, and especially when it's poetry, sometimes it's really fun to interpret in your own way, and I think we can always, suspension of disbelief, we can always still do that for ourselves, you know, I like my version better, whatever, you know, the artist, what, are they, what do they know, and I'm, as an artist, I say, absolutely do that to us, we don't care, but if you want to know our version, I think that is a really fun world to get into together, for sure. And I think this, this point comes back to what Ian was saying about why uh, timing is so important and being able to uh, have your social media message tied to current events, that is basically tying to things that people are already familiar with, that they're yeah. thinking about or talking about anyway. So yeah. you're finding another way to make it relevant to, to their conversation. Yeah, and um, all, all of this is just basically, I mean, Ro was talking about this earlier, it's, it's word of mouth, right? But I mean, word of mouth is, used to be fleeting, it's now permanent, right? Like everything is indexed. So, yeah. um, you know, every comment that we make is becoming easier to find um, and preserve for posterity. Um, and data is being collected. We've never created more data than we ever have, and we've never indexed more of it. We've never served it up more to people than we ever have. So, I mean, you know, you hate to rely on science, you know, for art, but, in, you know, when it comes to business, it's, it's something that you routinely do. So when we're telling these stories, I mean, we're, we're using the science, the data, to help us, in, you know, to help inform us, that are like, what do people actually care about? 
And that sounds mechanical, but it's actually, um, I think if everyone could have done that throughout history, um, a lot more of that would have been done. Um, you know, and it, it might have changed the content permanently, um, you know, of what people were creating. Because, you know, sometimes if you're just holed up, um, you know, as a hermit in a room, um, you know, the content that you create would be different than someone that was kind of out and about and part of society. Um, we've seen that historically from people that have created, you know, been both, both kinds of people, um, and they've created different kinds of content. So um, now we're under so much pressure to create a higher volume of it, though, right? So which is, you know, maybe something else to talk about. I mean, like the responsibility as a storyteller um, is, like, is, is that you have to tell whether it's one story in an infinite number of chapters or a high volume of, you know, stories that are really light and shareable. I mean, this brands who have historically said that we're not in the content business now find themselves as actual publishers because they've built yeah. up the size of their, you know, social media channels and it's gone from becoming an asset um, to a liability. Because, you know, <laughs> the, you know when you, 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 you may have, you may have spent a lot of money acquiring a particular audience, but, um, you know, whether it's algorithmically or um, organically, you know, the, people are not going to see what it is that you have to say unless they actually find it interesting. Um, you know, so being interesting, you know, making good content has become um, table stakes if you actually want those channels to be distribution channels and not just kind of a, a black hole, um, you know, places where yeah. you just drop content and then no one ever yeah. sees it. I think creating content is a place where you have to separate yourself from all of the, uh, all of the tools that we have. I think every artist, I don't know about you, Daria, has to have this time where you have um, a fallow field and where you are actually a part and you can come up with that organic uh, aspect. I mean, and marketing is not the only place where I use storytelling. If you are going to do anything about a social movement, truth, big T truth, is something that people aren't going to have an Im immediate positive response to, particularly if it means changing habits or, or sharing things that they didn't want to share in the first place. And so when I think when we are looking for a story that uh, it's a different place and a different mindset than when we are telling stories and evaluating you know how to distribute that. I think that you have to sit in two different chairs and the chair that we sit in to find content is very different which is one of the reasons why I think that everybody's looking for content. That's what one of the things that I think is why it's in short supply. If you get too caught up in this, um, uh, what makes something viral? Again, you're moving further and further away from the human experience, mm -hmm. and the human experience is something that is deeply paradoxical. Every single one of us has uh, has experienced certain human events. We have all been betrayed. We have all been forgiven. We've all fallen in love, and all of us have been dumped. <laughs> and if you have a this is really not interesting. Or, or so, tasered or, or pepper spray. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been tasered. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, okay. That's not a universal human experience. So uh, somebody went after you because they decided you did, did something wrong. But, That's because you were profiling them online, Ian. Yeah, right, I know. Right. I know. <laughs> Who is it? Uh, data logic now knows. Yeah. So I, I just think that when you're looking, I think it's important when you're looking for content to be able to unplug. Yeah, I, I, I love that point though, just to remind us about the uh, common emotions that we have, are sort of universally shared and resonant for for people, and it makes me come back to uh, Ian's comments about what's necessary for a company to be able to have this conversation, this authentic conversation through social media. Can a company um, express universal human emotions? Can a company be an individual? Can, it, can we relate to them as if they have had those same heartbreak and forgiveness and all those other great emotions? Uh, you know, I think, I think a company can't, because by definition, a company is a fairly inanimate object, unless you're Mitt Romney, in which case companies are Supreme people. Court. I was going to say. Okay. So, uh, companies are people. Yeah. So, uh, but, uh, you know, the, br the brands can, though, right? The brands, yeah. um, I, we've had people that have been nameless, faceless brands. Like, you know, one of the 
one of the required viewings that I try to make our clients watch is um, exit through the gift shop. I love that movie. Oh, so, so, cool. um, so we, box. yeah, so good. So, so that's the point, right? So, and the reason why I brought up, you know, tasering and pepper spraying <laughs> in, 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 the, in the list of things that people relate to is that I mean, you know, Banksy uses all of the contexts in, um, you know, to create his art, right? So it's place. So where he does his art is important. Um, time, he's usually making commentary on something that's, you know, of the moment and pretty relevant. Um, and street art in general is temporary in the sense that, um, you know, uh, authorities tend to get rid of it, <laughs> right? And so... Um, Plexiglass over at New Orleans. Right, or preserve nice. it and then sell it, right? That's and so, so good. Which takes me to the other reason, you know, why Exit Through the Gift Shop is important because then you have a guy like Mr. Brainwash yeah. who seems to manufacture that. Um, and, you know, the, the point that this, this movie is daring to make is that, you know, it's questioning can you manufacture that kind of commentary and turn it into a business? And, um, you know, when you're looking at, you know, at a brand, it's like which, which are you going to be? Um, the answer is generally probably somewhere in the middle. Um, although a lot of brands um, tend to go the, the Mr. Brainwash route and create like a lot of repetition, you know, try to do like campaign, use, you know, they, they don't necessarily use mixed media, but they tend to put a lot of the same things together all the time right. and get very formulaic um, about it. And, um, you know, eventually that goes from being, um, you know, in, initially interesting to getting annoying. Um, and, then you yeah. get ad, and then you get ad campaigns. And then you get um, blindness. Mm -hmm to them. So, um, you know, yeah. being, you know, brands have to be able to be unpredictable, um, not afraid to um, share a point of view that is, um, you know, who they really are. And most brands have not gone, you know, under the, through the, the therapeutic exercise of discovering who in fact they are. Um, you know, what the kinds of things that, you know, how you behave. Um, you know, when you, one of the examples I like to use is that, you know, if you if you donate a lot of money to a particular organization, you're a benefactor, right? But if you give a lot of money all the time, you're a philanthropist. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and it's which one, which one do you want to be? Um, you know, that's uh, so that consistent behavior is rewarded by people associating you with a particular quality. And when you're branding, I mean, that's generally what it is that you're trying to do is be associated with a set of qualities that define who you are, which is different than your competition. Well, and I think the other thing with uh, with brands too is, uh, I mean, great brands try to own an emotion or maybe one or two, but they don't own all emotions. Yep. And I think, you know, when it comes to storytelling, you can kind of traverse through all of these different emotions. But, you know, you look at Coca-Cola and focusing on happiness as sort of the extreme example, right? They're putting their stake in the sand and saying, look, Coca-Cola is about happiness. Um, and now whether you believe that or not, you know, they've kind of gone out there and said, this is what we're going to be talking about, and everything's going to ladder up to that, and every other marketer looks at them and says, wow, we wish we were that strategic. Um, you know, and, and I think that there is something valid about this idea of trying to own that emotion um, and picking what that should be. But, yeah, I think Ian's right. I mean, it's not the same as turning a brand into a person. Yeah, it's funny to me when people ask me about this uh, stuff because I'm I'm a singer. I don't know about companies. I've never worked at a company, but I do talk about this stuff a lot now. And I always say, you know, um, when I'm you know working with with people on this in this avenue, that you know, it's funny. I think we get into this head trip where you you start thinking. What's a, like what Annette was saying? What are the common experiences? What are what are the emotions that people want to feel? And you're like, wait, do a gut check for a second. You're still a person. Like we still all share these qualities, and so all the humans that work at companies are still humans, and we all still have the same human experience. So sometimes you don't have to get so head trippy about it. You can kind of look in the mirror and think, well, what what matters to me? What would I respond to? You know, and just think about yourself and and. Um, remember that we do share those common connections and, and every time we can kind of ring that bell it not only can do a Pavlov thing and make us whatever pay attention or buy or whatever but it also just feels good it, feel, it feels good to connect and I think both in you know marketing storytelling music whatever that's that's always sort of at the heart of it you know modern brands have trouble when they get dehumanized right so like when um, when a when a brand's visionary leader, founder, what have you, is no longer there for whatever reason, right? I mean, yeah. people, the expectations change of that brand and usually not for the better, right? Yeah. And, the, you know, and it sets them up as a, 
you know, as uh, that that becomes a challenge that they have to overcome. Obviously, like Apple is the elephant in the room in that in that part of the discussion. But um, you know, people you get benefits of the doubt. Um, you know, when you've established yourself for making decisions because you have vision. Um, Apple, it's happened to Apple. You know. Uh, Amazon, Netflix, like Reed Hastings, right? Like, you know, a lot of these companies get, are able to, um, you know, craft their stories over time and not have to react to the stock market, for example, um, which is now used to be a long-term thing. Now it's short-term. Um, you know, that's, uh, you know, they, they've had to create narratives that, that they hope will live beyond, um, you know, the people that created them in the first place. And um, it's, very, it's very difficult to do unless you kind of become a portfolio company like Procter & Gamble, Unilever, um, which are in essence like nameless, faceless organizations and they let the brands um, become individual humanizing elements. I mean like look, Unilever has Ben and Jerry's. They can oh, get, wow. You can't, you can't get like that. more polar opposite yeah. right, than, um, than this big nameless, faceless company who you, most people could not tell you even what country it's based in. Yeah. Um, you know, and Ben and Jerry's, which everyone could tell you is Vermont. And, and awesome. And Ben and Jerry, and awesome. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I just did a, imagining if me and me and my geniuses online ever had a flavor when they had free cone day the other day we were coming up with these crazy yeah. flavor names it was awesome <laughs> well listen I, I think that um, we should probably wrap up our times about over but I just wanted to say how uh, wonderful it's been to sort of emotionally connect with all of you guys in, in this great conversation. <laughs> um, how appreciative I am to technology and Google Plus for enabling us to be able to have this kind of you know, intimate, honest conversation even though we're all in different places in the world. Uh, and I wanted to encourage everybody to come join us at the Future of Storytelling Summit this coming October 3rd. Uh, we're going to have another wonderful, wonderful full day event there. Um, so thank you guys again for being part of this and it's really fun to talk to you and I hope to continue the conversation uh, in the weeks and months to come. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Charles. Thank you. Great seeing you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. See you in October. Bye, <laughs> day. Go get some Ben and Jerry's for dessert. Yeah, let's go guys. <laughs> <laughs> And drink absolute responsibly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, Charlie, before we go, how can people uh, find out about how to come to the Future of Storytelling? Oh, sure. Well, the best thing is to come to our website, which is thefutureofstorytelling.org. Awesome. Uh, and we, will, we haven't opened for registration yet. Uh, that's going to happen in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but that's when we'll be able to have people sign up and, and come join us. Uh, and we'll have our weekly hangouts too. So come back cool. and join us next every Wednesday at about twelve thirty. Uh, we have a weekly conversation. So hope you join us for the next one. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks, 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 thanks everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs> thanks, Ian. Bye, bye. <laughs>